Ulster Television's archives are the starting point for the exhibition Tilt at Windmills, which is currently on show at the Centre for Contemporary Art Derry London Derry. The show is full of old footage, real and imagined, with glitches, loops, a cryptarch, teletext and more, featuring work by artists Yarko Rasanen, Fanula Doran, Paul Moore and Robin Price, and curated by Miriam E. Schuppert. My name's Catherine Hamorik and I'm joined for this roundtable podcast by Miriam and Yarko and also by Sinead Vranek cashel who is the curator for Northern Ireland Screen, who are responsible for digitising UTV's archives. And Sinead develops live cinema projects using these archives. Yarko Rasanen is an artist working with photography, moving image and sound. He frequently uses algorithms creating new visuals from already existing images, questioning the realism connected to the image files that we consume. Originally from Finland, Yarko is based in Berlin and graduated from the Finnish Academy of Arts Time and Space Art Department in 2011, and his work has featured in the Moscow Fourth Biennale, Ars Electronica in Linz, and R17 Chiasma. Mirami Schuppe completed her PhD in curating at Ulster University in 2016 and is currently director for Titanic Gallery and Arte Artists Association in Turku. She has worked as an independent curator across Europe and her current research and practice is focused on questions of ethics and curating. Sinead Vranek Cashel was born in Belfast where she currently lives and works. Sinead's practice invites people to play building communities of practice, sharing spaces, and getting people together to do things that might range from performance to installation and curating. As well as being a research associate with us here at CCA, Sinead is a member of Be Beyond and the Turner Prize nominated Collective Array, whose work is currently on show at the Herbert Museum in the Turner Prize exhibition in Coventry until the 12th of January, 2022. Thank you all for joining me today, and I'm looking forward to finding out more about the work in the exhibition and the archives. Uh, perhaps starting with you, Sinead, what is Northern Ireland Screen and where do the UTV archives date from? So Northern Ireland Screen is the National Screen Agency for the north of Ireland, and part of that um, screen agency includes the Digital Film Archive, who I work for. And the archive is basically like a digital larder of home movies, TV programs, artist films, short films. And we even have like a few feature films that were made here. And the one thing that they all have in common is that they have some kind of connection with the north of Ireland. So that might be that they were made here, made by people from here or made by people from here in all other parts of the world. We don't have our own National Film Archive yet in Northern Ireland, so it means that we don't have the resources to look after like physical cans of film and VHS tapes. So instead, we're a digital archive, so we work with different collections, different individual people who have their own films and get funding to digitise that so we can share it with the public. And really, like the quickest way for people to see the kinds of things that we have is on our website where you can watch it for free and we'll put like links up to that. Um, but there's also lots of other ways that we bring the archive to people including collaborations like this exhibition and CCA and um, for my job I'm always most excited to see what happens when we bring other people into the archive to work with the material in ways that we maybe would never have anticipated before and find different ways that people can come into contact with what they're interested in in this larder of ingredients that we have so one of the biggest collections that we work with is UTV and UTV itself started in 1959. And for people who don't know what UTV is, it's like our local commercial television station. And so it's kept its own archive um, since it began in 1959. But when ITV bought the station in 2015, then they looked to split the collection. And there was anxiety that this really rich source of like history of this place would be lost. So ITV, the public records office in Northern Ireland screen, got together to make a plan of how we could keep access to that material, but also at the same time, make sure that it was taken care for in a way that the physical things would be there for for future generations as well as the content. So now UTV is split between there's some finished programs in ITV and Leeds in their archive. Some of the news is in the current UTV so the news team can use it and the rest is in the public records office in Belfast and Northern Ireland Screen works between those sites to select stuff to get it digitised, get it out for artists to use for the public to watch and more importantly just so that it's there for future generations to decide what's important with it and we've been able to do 
do that with funding from the government here, so the Department of Communities, and then also project funding from BFI in London and the Broadcast Authority of Ireland, who funded the stuff that Yorko has been working with. There's been lots of projects with different artists over recent years. So how did this project come about? Was it an invitation to you, Miriam, or did you approach Northern Ireland Screen? So it was an invitation from Sinead. I had already done a project in connection to the Northern Ireland Screen Digital Film Archive in 2017. Yes, <laughs> so it feels like such a long time ago already that I can't even remember which year it was. It was with Ulde Kafea, and um, so who's a Finnish artist, and um, we did with Ulrika a show at P Squared in Belfast. Uh, she was using the tourism board material mostly and some of the other material also from the archive. And I have been working quite a bit myself with um, archives, photographic archives mostly, did my PhD also in connection to that, looking into how curators commission artists to do archival interventions. And then I guess Sinead was pleased enough with the project we did with Ulrika. And then she invited me to come back to the digital film archive at Northern Ireland Screen. This was already, I think we started working on this project probably in 2018, end of 2018, and then probably 2019. I did quite a bit of research, just um, exploring different themes and also looking at the footage available in the archive. And then later in 2020, then I... I was in contact with Jarko and uh, we started then working together. So basically Sinead invited me and then I invited Jarko. And that was the starting point sort of to this, this exhibition and research project. I think before uh, finding out more about uh, your take on the archive material, Jarko, I'd just like to ask a little more about, about how the archive is constructed. So is it is it parceled into particular sections under subheadings or is it sort of free form or by timeline? How does it work, Sinead? The easiest way maybe to describe it is it's a bit like a kaleidoscope. The archives come about in like lots of different ways. So sometimes it'll be chance if someone turns up with a bag of films that they find in an attic and then a discussion starts about trying to identify what is it, who owns it, is it of considered worth pursuing and digitizing? And then other things like UTV where there was this kind of event that happened and then this discussion around, okay, we could possibly lose this massive collection. What are we going to do about it? So each strand of the archive has come and fallen into place in different ways through chance, through deliberate decisions, through long agonizing projects. And really for people who approach the archive, like the best way to do it is almost like the way you would walking into a charity shop. You might say, I really want to find this thing and you won't, fi- you won't find it there. And it might be that you're looking in the wrong section. It might be that it's, it's not there or else that kind of thing. You have chance upon something that you were never expecting expecting to see that suddenly you fall totally in love with so both when we do our selection process to bring stuff into the archive and when we bring artists and curators in to work with the archive you really kind of have to have very open expectations of what direction it's going to take you in so when I started in the archive it was there was a very small collection of stuff that had been put together when it started as like a millennium project so it was a mixture of BBC and UTV and it was never designed to be on the internet and like little bits of Pathé Newsreel and things like that. And then the BFI started this national UK-wide project called Britain on Film, where they wanted to try and digitise film from all different parts of the UK and put it on this massive map that people could search and find their hometown and where their mother grew up and different things like that. So that sort of set us out on a mission to try and find things based on the themes that the BFI had set. So some of that was like um, disability on film, some of it was countryside or coastal you know so it's these very broad themes that then we had to go out and search what individual people had people bringing in their home movies and um, we went into UTV and worked with the archivist Pauline there to look at what might be in UTV to fit these themes that we could start to get a sense of what would be of interest to the public now as well as with the funding you never know when you're going to get it again so you're also trying to have to make that long-term decision of what might not be of that great an interest to us now but would be of interest to the future so it's quite a complicated process of how we make those decisions as a team and we try and talk to as many different people as possible to kind 
kind of get beyond our own view of what we think might be interesting or of value. And we're an archive for the whole of the north of Ireland. So we're always trying to find people and places that aren't covered. So it's not just a Belfast archive because that's where we happen to be based and where UTV is based. So bringing artists in has also then changed how we think about what we look for. Because for an artist to work with stuff, it's a very different thing that someone who just wants to watch a film online would be looking for in the same way that if you look at a filmmaker's rushes compared to a finished program that you would watch on television, they're very different objects. So we found that actually you have to suspend a lot of your normal judgment calls that if you were just watching something without having to make a decision as to what value is and other people's insights are really crucial in disrupting those assumptions that you might have yourself or those blind spots that you might not be noticing to look for. And the other thing is with the archive is that sometimes you'll know, so for example, like the Jeff Dudgeon uh, decriminalisation case, we know that that happened, Jeff's still around, we know the dates, we know precise details, but we just can't find it in UTV. And we don't know whether that is like because it existed and no longer exists because it's catalogued in a way that we can't discover it or whether it was never covered in the first place. So sometimes knowledge itself isn't enough to get something found. Yeah, I think it's so interesting what you're saying about what might be interesting in the future because I know some of the things looking back it's that really mundane footage of just like a street and noticing how different the cars were or the signage is from 30 40 years ago where it's super mundane Mirami I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah, so that was what I was going to say in connection to what you were just saying there. Like, we, we we don't know, like, the mundane stuff might be interesting in the future. And this is exactly what I think has happened with um, teletext, for example. So connected to this exhibition, that teletext has been such a, like, mundane part of our lives back in the days. And yet it's not recorded in any way in the archive. Right, Sinead? It's, it's really, it's... It's just it's absent from the archive, which is super interesting. And then then also kind of like, well, it's the it's brilliant how Yarko then and the other artists who were invited, Finola and uh, Robin and Paul, then were kind of uh, using that as a starting point then for for creating new work for the exhibition. I think one of the key responses we've had to the show have been people just seeing the teletext pieces, which are they're not archival pieces, they're new work inspired by the sort of the memories. And I think it was it photographs of teletext uh, that the artists were able to see. Um, so there was um, UTV used to publish a magazine called the TV Post, which just get TV listings in 1959 to the late 60s and this has recently been digitized so we give the artists that as material to look up for inspiration to create this teletext that had never existed in UTV and I think like one of the things that's been exciting about that is again just chances to bring artists in to do something that maybe they've never done before uh, rather than the pressure to come in with something that you've tried and tested and know will hold up is like with the archive it's a chance to kind of well through these experimentations of, of learning this like obsolete skill is something valuable comes out of it in terms of our knowledge and understanding of the past and that's precious regardless of how polished a piece of artwork comes out at the end so it's really exciting to do the workshop and have a go at playing around with this obsolete technology uh, given definite flashbacks to sort of 90s paint <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's been just such a nostalgia for everyone above a certain age things like oh my dad used to check the football scores every Sunday or uh, for me it was cinema listings and bamboozle uh, <laughs> it was particularly strong memories um so it's been really enjoyable seeing that and then trying to explain teletext to everybody who is too young to experience it saying like well this was kind of like the internet before the internet but Yarko uh when we were putting up the exhibition I remember you saying that you just watched hours and hours and hours of footage uh, from the UTV archives so how did you go about selecting which different topics you might be interested in well, actually, I just want to comment on the last topic, the teletext. Uh, Sinead uh, does, Anna Screen has VHS recordings of the TV programs. Yes, so we, we do. We have video recordings. We have like VHS, Betacam, different things like that, as well as the cine film that your project had been working with. 
because I think it with the enthusiasts of Teletext, I think it is possible nowadays to reconstruct from the VHS recordings, possibly bits of the Teletext of the times. So that's just one idea. So it, maybe it's not completely lost. But anyhow, I looked at a lot of the footage I got from Miriami. And uh, yes, I, first I tried like a topical approach, like um, what are the good and moral things of an artist to uh, deal with. So I tried watching, uh, okay, it was very a lot of program i was um, a little bit blind selecting whatever i found that was interesting but then i looked at for example the youth programs of people in selecting what they're going to do after their studies in life and how they're preparing for like living alone or something like this kind of very random material also the nature and the environment and green topics in some programs felt very righteous things to watch and observe but my studies didn't give me like an idea what should I approach I needed to watch a lot of material I got more like structural approaches like maybe if I from the Google generation that I can just type in a topic and then use all the material because my working methods are based on like processing a lot of information so I wanted to use that as a strength for my artistic approach that I don't necessarily dive into a single topic or an idea, but rather take uh, uh, masses and uh, process the masses with my techniques. So it probably was the influence of seeing and observing how much there is material that I wanted to also deal with masses of information instead of like literal topics. And, and the literal topics kind of came along during the process of I found some interesting food that's for myself and then in the very end phase of building the exhibition or doing the exhibition i figured out that okay there is maybe some thematics included this is maybe like um at this point good to good to point out that i did a pre-selection for Jarko. so basically during the year that i was researching already before um, inviting Jarko along there were certain themes and thematics i was interested in and future was one thing. It's kind of like, how is the future built for younger generations in a certain way through the TV programs? And then one that ended up also then being in the show actually present is protests. So I was very interested in sort of seeing how, because UTV is a commercial or was a commercial station, then how are protests being broadcasted or recorded, first of all, and then broadcasted, and then after that also archived and processed. So it's kind of like thinking about how what, what kind of protest imagery is actually made possible or made available for us in present day. And those were sort of a couple of themes that were what I was interested in. And um, also, as Sinead was saying, that it, the structure of the archive is such that you can't really look for certain things or you can look for certain things, but you might not be finding them. So it was I was always saying to Sinead what I was interested in to start with. And then Sinead would come back to me and say, like, well, we have digitized these and these things, and then we have cataloged these and these things. And I'll go and see as we go. Uh, what actually I can find that is somehow responding to the themes I was interested in. And then once I invited Jarko to come along to the project, then I was passing on those materials to him. And then though he was then after that also requesting other, so animals, for example, that he has used in Crypt Arc. So there, there was kind of like, there was a certain pre-selection that was uh, passed on to Jarko and then he went on on his kind of like following his own interest and so on. And so it's, it's kind of like, like it's it's very mediated process whenever this kind of interventions into an archive are, are done because there is due to the nature of the material like the physical material and so on the artist can't be given access like the organization or the institution can't say like here is a key go and run it around uh, which would be extremely interesting but it's always mediated so like through many many different people and that is also something that uh, is always in impacting of course the outcomes and then yeah maybe somebody else will take it from here I lost my track of thought <laughs> <laughs> 
it's interested just what Yarko was saying about that like masses of information because I think for us the struggle in the archive when we went from dealing with a couple of hundred films that you knew intimately because if you catalogued them you, you watched them loads of times and when we worked on the previous project with Rika it was like we would have a conversation and off the top of my head I could be okay this specific film this thing this thing but then when new TV came in and all of a sudden we were digitizing thousand like I think at the minute we're working on six thousand tapes it's like even if all the staff were trying to watch it that it's gone like a miniature internet it's beyond the scale that one person can have all of that in their head so all of a sudden it's like we're having to evolve into a different way of dealing with the archive when my default way would be much more that watching things and seeing what happens so it's sort of like Yarko's process is like a step ahead of the direction that the archive is growing in and maybe the approaches that need to be taken with it when it's this massive unwieldy information but as Mariami was saying that there is this kind of mediation and like the reasons for that there's lots of different reasons for it for example with things like the actual physical tapes is like sometimes you don't know there might only be one play left in that tape before it's broken so a lot of the time with tapes we have to digitize them and take a chance so it's that kind of thing of there's things that are too fragile just to allow people access to then with the past it's like the people on UTV like these are real people real lives so some of the material it might be that someone disclosed their medical information in a news report about a healthcare scandal or there's things to do with the 30 year civil war that we had so it wouldn't be responsible to allow people unfettered access into that material and the archive itself isn't allowed unfettered access into the material and also one of the things whether it's terrorist board stuff that's maybe very ethically uncomplicated or reporting on the troubles is the way our archive works is we ask for permission to use the material the person who made the material still owns that material so ITV still have copyright so they have the ultimate say about whether we can or can't use stuff the same if it was someone's home movies they would have the same say that ITV have over the UTV material and for us it's about retaining that mutual respect so as well with um, artists it's a responsibility for us to let them in because then that affects whether people can continue to do stuff and access material in the future because we're always trying to respect those relationships with the fact that these are real people real lives in the films as well as it's just like really exciting material to work with and get carried away with so it's always a bit of a negotiation of various obstacles that in themselves like with the tally text as these obstacles can create really interesting starting points for projects and really good creative dilemmas rather than seeing it as something that's just going to smother creativity. So how much freedom do the artists have and Yarko were you acutely aware of that responsibility? Of the responsibility yes well I guess I have ended up working with like a found footage or existing material that I'm not very confident of using camera because I feel the ethics of like uh, if I take a photo of somebody I still have primitive thoughts that I might lose somebody's soul or I don't know I'm not comfortable with photographing people so it feels like for me it's a relief if somebody has done the decision already that this will be uh, virtualized or digitalized and then at that point I don't have any more problem of uh, using the material for some reason because somebody else has made the decision and kind of entered to the uh, juridical um, process of the, having permission and, and the laws of how you may use the material or publish it and also the distance in time makes it different because i'm i'm dealing with the corona times uh, this uh, that all of a sudden we have more uh, recordings of artists like talks online instead of some public events so then i have to deal with the fact that my stories and and uh, video videos end up in, uh, archived somewhere and i don't want to usually look at them myself after a couple of years i can return to them so the time gives kind of peace and distance so if i tilt that windmill exhibition there's all the material was luckily so old so i didn't feel bad at using somebody's face for example in camouflage and surveillance where people's faces are deformed through algorithms or colorized or camouflaged so this is kind of very personal thing to do for somebody's face or an image of a face but the distance made me feel more at peace with the process 
And also uh -huh. Sinead, of course, had done the pre-selection already in a way that there was also the, the material we got from UTV archive. There, then was already somebody had had a look at it already and said like, OK, you can use it. This is OK to use. So you didn't have to make personally, Jakko, you didn't have to make the selection whether it's, it's suitable or not, which is also, I think, we, brings us to quite an interesting topic of somebody from outside Northern Ireland coming uh, like with no previous connection at all to Northern Ireland and due to the pandemic also not even able to travel to Northern Ireland while doing the research then somebody coming in uh, virtually coming in and using material that you I'm, I'm sure Jarko, you were reading something about the history of Northern Ireland but like a completely different relationship to the, the troubles and what, whatever was going on or still is going on of course partially and then this is also if we refer back to the film or like the work you were just referring there where you were camouflaging people that was using sort of the um, protest imagery because then Catherine for example you were saying about that like oh this is giving a fairly one-sided uh, interpretation potentially of the past the material that was being used for the film and it's well if the artist is not coming from that lived experience of course they are looking at the material in a completely different way and I think this is also one of the strengths of bringing artists to do archival interventions because they they just look at the material with completely different eyes and different mindset and so on which might also bring with it some potential problems but like yeah it's it's just this kind of fresh uh, pair of eyes that is paying attention to other things than maybe even local artists would be doing yeah, it was also curious to see which materials ended up in that work because it was also a response to what material you had been supplied with, Yarko, as well. So it was sort of a little portrait of what had been digitised for, for whatever reason, which had been sent over. So, yeah, that was really curious to see. I want to ask about glitches because the show is full of glitches from, from this work where you've used an algorithm, Yarko, of identifying emotions using this AI where it just sort of goes berserk and it's like happy, furious, happy, happy, sad, um, and all of these different things and uh, goes all across the image, whether it's a face or a scrunched up shoulder that looks a bit like a face for a, a split second. And I've got two questions, one for you, Yarko, about what, what is your fascination with glitches? And also to Sinead, how are the glitches dealt with when you're archiving? Is there a sort of desire for keeping the, the best quality of things or just those different qualities of the different materials? materials that you're working with and those glitches, is that sort of part of it? Okay, well I did my first program uh, where I manipulated the file structure of a photograph as my graduation work from Art Academy and I used the same algorithm or some variations of it in the show also in Cryptarch and it, it, what it does is, is that it cuts image into slices and then it reorganizes them according to simple rules like linear rules like let's say from darkest to brightest so I wanted to make the point out in the textual part of my uh, work that uh, it is not glitch because glitch is um, associated mostly with mistakes or errors and of course I love errors and mistakes because I think glitch in itself it breaks the contract of an apparatus whatever it promises to deliver us if it doesn't usually through some malfunction of if there's like a, too much information or something then the apparatus fails and and then it reveals its the medium's borders kind of like a Clement Greenberg uh, mediums uh, qualities it, if you go to the borders what are the borders of certain medium I'm kind of old-fashioned with this idea but i think it reveals whatever the contract is like it can be different file structure the most common uh, association probably nowadays is like a digital television for us if there is like a break in the transmission or connection then uh, it looks like very much like one of the works what i referred also to the surveillance and camouflages where i use data machine effect that is um, a bi file format associated way of glitching images so i've always been fascinated with this kind of breaks in the rules and how it kind of opens up uh, the realism or kind of the materiality of information for the viewer that this is actually we think we look at the image of a tree like okay my 
first image was like a tree in the nature and people were wondering why or actually the tree was um, in the border of, of Finnish uh, Russian embassy and Finland so it was on the Russian side anyway people asked why it's not glitched from the middle part it looks normal but it's glitched from the down and up because the light comes from up in the nature so in the horizon there is like natural linear transition so i want to point out that my method is like more related to maybe conceptual art or constructivist painting in this sense it happily it looks like a glitchy thing that um, questions our point of view okay it's an image of a tree or, or is it an image file that we observe from a screen but anyhow i'm also interested in, in this kind of systematical approach towards my glitches even though there is well uh, we can speak more of this later but anyhow i think it's important for me to say that it's not only glitch for glitch sake i'm interested in uh, reorganizing uh, information and probably revealing worlds within uh, these structures that we are not used to see from an archive perspective with glitches is so when we get stuff digitized and files are sent back to be quality check is there would be the things that are glitches that are mistakes of like that digitization process and when there's things that are to do with that digitization process then we would sort of seek to correct it if possible but if the glitches are in like the original content so whether that's like distortion in like a, a videotape or like scratches on cine film or where the image is started to decay that we would keep so we would try and preserve the glitches that are from the original content and try and iron out the glitches that are from just um, error in the digitization process and then for again because we use the archive in a sort of like larder or toolbox style way myself and one of my other colleagues it's like when we find glitches as we tend to keep like a store of them because they feel like oh there's there could be projects and that there could be things that like certain circumstances where you really want those effects so for example I have a folder in my edit and suite that's just all scratches on film when you have like in between two news stories they'll just be white or black and just loads of scratches on it and the same with the tape these like colored disintegration glitches so there's that kind of thing if you're always watching the material with like multiple endpoints in mind so if you're going to do like a screening of something then you might be like well these glitches actually disrupt the audience's experience of what what you're trying to communicate with them so we might edit them out but in the original they're still always there and then we do have this kind of digital store of these glitches and things as sort of like a project waiting to happen and I think as well with digitization with archives is like in the past people would have digitized film by just projecting on a wall and refilming it and sometimes technologies can like interfere with the quality of something that in the future you're undoing those mistakes so I feel like digitization now it's like how can you interfere the least so that as technology progresses people are always able to go back to that original source and in our archive we have to like outsource a lot of that process so I wouldn't be working directly with like the most technical people who would have the understanding of those rules and the different things that um, Yorko was able to play about with of how these new digitized images are constructed and what was really interesting about the previous project Mariami was involved in is we'd been spending all this time turning cine film into digital files and the artist Ulrika then decided to reverse that process so edited together a film with the digital files and then had that transferred onto Cine. And so when you came into the exhibition, you were watching this old projector projecting these digitized files that then had been put back into this like analog format, which was really interesting. And then while the film was playing, then the 16 mil film was also that it got scratched during the show. So that was again damaged. And it's really this kind of materiality and, and how it's kind of like the unwanted, whereas Yarko is working like a, per, on purpose with the kind of potential glitches or creating sort of through the use of algorithm, this uh, transitions to the image that look like glitches, then of course it's the, the unwanted glitches. It's kind of like parallel concepts, but but not really connected in a certain way. But I just wanted to say that the, the mistakes in the archive is something that every single day I've done a few, few kind of archival interventions with artists and every single project, every single artist has been interested in the mistakes. So there is something, there is this fascination of, of kind of like how time and other factors also impact archival material. That's certainly something and like uh, very 
sort of like a, a big question in many ways. And it's also, what do you do with it? Because normally, as, as Sinead was saying, that when you're digitizing, then kind of like you are probably not going to select for, for your online collection, for example, that material that is damaged. But at the same time, it's kind of, um, how, how do you make the selections and so on? And these tend to be the things that, that artists quite often are picking then and somehow incorporating into their projects or reworking them and so on. So I did in, in 2013, I did a, a project at the Finnish Museum of Photography and there was um, working with Helvi Ahnen collection. So it was a Finnish uh, female amateur photographer who had left behind about 5,000 5, negatives, but hardly any prints at all. And I was working with Herta Kiski and Nina Vatanen on the archive. And uh, Nina Vatanen, the other artist, was focusing mainly, really, on the mistakes, all kind of like, because it was film camera, then, of course, like, whenever the film wasn't advancing properly, so double exposures. And then also, what time does the film? So how does it deteriorate it? Or if the film had been developed in the wrong way, and it was kind of like coagulating or something, I can't even remember the right terms anymore. But um, this was kind of happening to the film material that was somehow creating interesting images, even if the subject of the actual photograph wasn't that interesting. But how did like technology or time interfere with the process of taking photographs? And then also potentially thinking, because we didn't know which of the photographs then actually were developed into paper, like prints, because there was no prints left, more or less, and uh, kind of imagining how would the photographer have been working with those images or felt like the, the photographs as well and a really good way into starting kind of getting your uh, fantasy or imagination going as well as uh, just a different starting point altogether to, to processing the archive but of course there are potentially also there might be some kind of ethical implications of course over there as well is it not doing justice then to the original material if you are focusing only on the mystery Mistakes, for example, and is it bringing something unwanted out? Because of course, I, I I suppose every photographer, for example, or every every artist or anybody who is leaving material for an archive would like the the good stuff to surface and and not not the mistakes, not the unwanted things from the archive actually to be brand, then brought to the surface or being exhibited within an exhibition context. So of course, there is like um, the artist has responsibility then to in in general general of course treating archival material with respect and not sort of I think what is often a problem with archival interventions with artists is that the artist is only kind of using material from the archive without giving anything back into it and I think this is something where, where Jarko has been really successful in uh, with, the, with this project I find that he's been really exploring different ways of going through masses of material and examining the different sort of like technology and materials and the contents of the archive in general. So I would hope at least that this is really not only taking something, excavating almost something from the archive, but also bringing it forward somehow and giving back to the archive. Yeah, but I think it's like one of the reasons that we're always interested in bringing people in to work with the archive is that thing of to learn, to see something from a different angle or learn something new about it. And the advantage is, is with these sorts of projects is you don't have to destroy the original for this other version to exist. And like we're actually able to allow these things to coexist and direct people's attention to it. So you can go on to the Crypt Arc and watch this sort of like fabulous disintegration of these 1960s black and white animals um, in some cases that are barely recognizable and then at the same time you can watch these like original rushes so I think we were always interested in the idea about because there's the opportunity for multiple versions of something to exist um, it's like how you put these things together or redirect the gaze in the archive with different people's interests and it's often most exciting when they are coming from a point of view where it's some like a certain kind of knowledge or perspective that's beyond what's within the archive already whether that's technology or coming at a Northern, Northern Irish film without the baggage of a Northern Irish <laughs> upbringing and at the same time we'll be bringing in local artists and musicians and people and activists as well who will be hyper 
uh, local, really immersed in the context of, of things, you know, so like we did projects with the Strand Art Centre in Wanda, looking at uh, the reproductive rights material in the discussions around um, what was happening with changes to the abortion law in Northern Ireland. So I think that's the beauty of it is this, there's lots of different ways it can be repurposed and people can still go back to the original source and have their own opinions or their own perspective on it. It's not that one takes priority over the other, you know, so I think that's back to that kind of image of this kaleidoscope that these connections are ever shifting and we found as well we did a project with craft makers and it allowed us when we went to catalogue the footage to have a much richer understanding of what these processes were so you'd see like lots of white sheets on a lawn and your own knowledge would take you no further than that and then working with weavers they'd be just like these are bleaching lawns this is what this process is and and the same with Yorko bringing in this sort of digital lens to this digitized material it can really enrich how the archive perceive the stuff and how the public perceive the stuff and then that helps make a case for well going forward then what are the next priorities for what needs to come into the the archive and all these artist interventions become part of the archive so long term they'll be preserved in the same way the, the UTV footage they've been working with has been preserved. Yeah, maybe you have, like, because we have mentioned CryptArc now a couple of times, maybe you could tell a little bit more about what CryptArc is and how did you start working on it and and what sort of, like, what, do, what does it do? How was it done and what does it do? Okay, so my starting interest in this CryptArc is, well, yes, it's, I asked from Shinet, uh, material of animals. So I thought that was like a relevant point, kind of like also coming from a generation where we have been taught with the same kind of material I saw from new TV, like about the future and kind of ethical life and like animal rights and so on. So I thought that the relationship between human and animal is an interesting starting point. But anyway, it's like more science fiction fantasy what I had before that maybe there comes like a inflation for realistic imagery in the distant future that we are not anymore necessarily observing the simulation. And like I said, my glitch algorithms are basically producing like a reorganizing the material into like a mathematical or linear forms. So this is kind of formalistic interest that could there be an artificial intelligence that perceives like a, as aesthetic value if some information is organized according to let's say mathematical rules or something that then could it be that some civilizations no matter human or artificial ones perceive at some point this glitching of the material as a surplus or like a, some a reason to maintain that information counter, in counterpoint to the realistic information and that is the original one. So I was interested in how the glitch could, like they're basically, I'm interested also in cryptography, how you can, well, in, in, in the end of my career, I will do a program that will reorganize all my career's work into the original form to reverse the project process. Well, <laughs> that's one idea. But anyhow, I think uh, CryptArc also, like the idea was that in Bible, they were selecting animals to the Ark for the future preservation. So I think the archive process in itself is doing the same. Like who knows what happens with simulations and gene technology in the future. Can we just print an animal with a bioprinter at some point from the screen or or then, well, I kind of thought that it's more interesting from certain like imaginary point of view, it's more interesting in the glitch form, the material, than in the original form. This kind of a thought uh, construction I had when I started to do that, kind of like uh, signals to the future or something. And yes, the work itself, it's online, visible, and then there's an the exhibition, there's like four channel spatial installation form with uh, the same material. So. I was just wondering how, because it was like a longer process I mean, you were in working with the archive before even deciding who you were going to invite to work with it. And then Yarko had the material for a long while during lockdown before we had a sense of what the exhibition might be. And I was just wondering for both of you about how I, the ideas changed from what maybe you were thinking in those initial stages to the kinds of conversations around when it was the plan for the actual exhibition, you know, because the crypt arc came out of wanting to have some sort of point to share whilst we were all still in lockdown so yeah I'd just be interested to hear from both of you how your ideas have sort of morphed 
So when I started looking into the archive, I was quite interested. As I said, I've been working a lot with archives and I was quite interested in this idea of path dependency. So when you make a decision about, I'll look into this collection and how does that lead you to the next one and so on. And then it was at the same time I was looking at the, the future material in the UTV collection and connecting these two ideas, sort of how does the, the decision we are making in so path dependency and also decision theory. So how do the decisions that we make in the present day impact the decisions we are going to make in the future and so on, this kind of idea of how do I end up going from this point where I am right now into the uh, distant future or something and how does that apply then to archives in a certain way and the digitization processes and so on and so forth. And I was initially quite interested in maybe working with an artist who would be using like video games or games in general as their, their medium. But then I bumped into Jarkos work through a, a common friend and was uh, interested in the way he is embracing. So it took took the whole project on a quite different path and um, that I could not have foreseen. But the, the way Jarko is using really contemporary technologies to in a in a very critical way to examine those very technologies and so not not being sort of like there's so much frenzy about like uh, AI for example at the moment and people are, are blindly fairly blindly kind of believing in it bringing us a better future <laughs> but what I really like about Jarko and his approach is that he's so critical and really thinking about the understanding the connection. So what has been in the past, how does that impact the way we are seeing images in the present day? So for example, the what you have been Yarko doing in your previous work is the packaging of TIFF images, photographs, for example, in a J JPEG format, and what does that to, do to an image? And how do these decisions that are made on our behalf impact the way we, we see images and so on and what, what is being saved for the future? And I was quite fascinated by the way you are really bringing this kind of uh, time span sort of like from the history to the present day to the future into working with photographs and moving image. And that was when, when the, the whole project took quite a different turn than what I had thought in the beginning. But I think it's also important for a curatorial process or artistic process is that you just have to follow wherever the project is taking you and not to try to force it in a certain direction so trying to keep that kind of open mind and then yeah I, I approached Jarko first and we had conversations about the material and so on and and then we continued having conversations and he had a look at the material the plan was for Jarko to travel to Belfast and do some kind of screening maybe or perform performance or, or something halfway through the project but like the pandemic really has been changing things quite a lot and uh, but this online uh, crypt arc is a brilliant way I think to also bring the project to wider audiences and also having like a different temporal presence. Yeah, the online version, yeah, I think what Miriam asked about the uh, gamification of, of artwork somehow, I think it was a good challenge for me. It's a very simple game, but it offers interactivity for the viewer and it's generative that it doesn't really repeat because there's like random functions into the online version. So like ultimately I thought that in the pandemic lockdown times cool to have like a generative audiovisual piece that you can check out from your computer only and with the chill out atmosphere and like a fireplace you can put it in full screen and just let it run or something like that and i'll include links to the cryptarch uh, in the description to this podcast as we're entering the final moments of, of this Roundtable podcast, uh, Sinead, it was really great hearing you talk about your approach to working with the archive and how collaborative it is. And I know that in the rest of your practice, um, you have that very collaborative and quite a playful approach to your work, both as an independent curator and with Array. And I'd just love to hear a bit more about that and your approaches. 
Yes, so really like at the core of all my work is that playful approach. So it's always when I find myself in a situation or with certain materials, it's like, what can we do with this and who else could get involved? It tends to be the impulse, whether it's working with the archive where I started as like a cataloger. So when I started, I wasn't brought in to do projects, but instantly when you're sitting watching this material all day, you're like, oh God, Phil could do something amazing with this. And you sit and immediately start thinking of like lots of ways that it could be used and brought to life. And I think as well, like in my practice, whether it's my solo work, it tends to be like interactive installations. So I turned Catalyst into like a working campsite um, years ago and had like Sam Castle building competitions and karaoke nights and things like that. Or like I've been working with Be Beyond now since I was in college in 2007. And so it was that kind of thing of, yeah, how can you play with this? Who could come play with you? And then what could come out of that that you couldn't have done if you just hoarded everything to yourself? So I feel like for me, collaboration is just sort of the natural actual like second impulse in any encounter or when I do shows we normally try and during that install phase bring Be Beyond in and do monthly meeting and that's like Be Beyond's like group of artists meet third Saturday of every month and perform in public space and even during lockdown we've been doing that on Zoom of just sort of finding ways that people can connect and create together and do things that go slightly beyond what you could do in like a solitary form so I found that like the archive was a real challenge because before my practice this was basically like making playgrounds uh, and then all of a sudden you're like oh we have to use a screen because there has to be digital footage and everything so it's been a real challenge over the years to try and figure out how do I bring that playfulness and this digital screen based stuff together in a way that feels tactile and spontaneous and that people can immediately fall into it without having to necessarily understand the mechanics of how something works so I find that I just sort of have different playmates for different kinds of projects so it's been amazing working with Array where it's just like we were protesting on the streets together and then trying to figure out how to make that into some kind of installation or communicate that somewhere else has been a really interesting rewarding challenge and then like with be beyond in the performance art and he's like bringing our monthlies from the street into like a weekly zoom where on your lunch you're just like quick warm up together and some people might be in Germany and Sligo and, and Derry and then for half an hour you're just having this like free for all on, on zoom together and then a bit of a chat and then it's like see you next week and I think things like that really kind of nourish my creativity so I'm always curious to be how can we expand this or what can we do with that and that's why I kind of feel like even in my role in the archive is as a curator I really feel like I'm just an artist on an extent ended massive residency and it's been really interesting to bring all different kinds of people into contact with that because I think as well working with heritage organizations as an archivist compared to trying to do that as an artist it does allow you a certain privileged access so equally I'm always interested in well how if I have permission to be here is there someone else who could get permission whilst that door is open so I guess yeah it's like looking for cracks and then investigating with other people is how I go about everything. <laughs> There was still something I wanted to ask Jarko about is the, the sound, because like uh, sound is such an important element of your work, like the video work. And it's also very present in the gallery. I hope Catherine is not completely fed up with listening to the same soundtrack over and over and over again. <laughs> but could you, could you, Jarko, maybe tell a little bit more about how do you go about making the, the like the soundtrack and what, what, what is your approach? to it and how does it connect with the, with the kind of visual? Uh, yes, in two of the works there is a sound very present, Cryptarch and Dance of the Knights. And also Dance of the Knights is kind of a glitch in the process because uh, it was found from a footage like I asked for, for animal things, but it was on the same tape and it talked to me uh, in a way that I wanted to use it. So actually it started, well, I got this idea. I wanted to do a dance version of Dance of the Knights because I also do hobby music. So then I found like old media file from 90s or where somebody had translated a party tour for Dance of the Nights into computer uh, notes, and then I interpreted it and put some soundtrack. And then I realized when I saw the Dance of the Night, uh, the, the re reenactment of some knights fighting in the NI screen archive. So I thought this is like a match. And that was more music video approach. But then Cryptarch 
is like the starting point for this scale video installation. I have a reference point in my mind, like a Vuichi Ikeda, Japanese artist, who made like data matrix and black and white, uh, very intense visuals where the soundtrack is composed also out of the visual material. So visually, I was inspired by this work. But I wanted to bring another point of view to the digital glitched animals. I wanted to bring like some human emotion. So I used emotionally manipulative uh, music or uh, ambient drone and to kind of direct the atmosphere to more meditative and more open, like to soften up the, the intensity of the visuals, soften up with static static kind of um, elements that you could listen to. And then it's more e easier to perceive this voluminous uh, effects. So it was the contrary for the group dark. It was like an um, ambient experience, what I wanted to reach with that. And the decision of keeping both of the works in the exhibition is more from the visual point of view that it doesn't allow diving in completely into the cryptarch uh, mood because you can hear the dance of the clients from the other room so uh, it's a little bit of bullying also of the audience i guess but to keep it more interesting I've really enjoyed the music that accompanies the crypto actually. It has this ambient rolling, it shifts over time. And I've really enjoyed kind of being immersed in it when we're, you know, doing the practicalities of turning the show on and off each day. And thank you so much for making the show. It's been uh, really great to, to be able to host it here at CCA and see the different people coming and recognizing different elements from those archives for people who are local, just going, oh, I recognize this bit, or people who aren't just trying to make out different forms. And so uh, being introduced to how you, you have viewed uh, these archives, which has been really great to have. So a final thank you again to all of our guests, Miriam Schubert. Yarko Rasanen and Sinead Branagh Cashel. This podcast was made possible with thanks to Arts Council for Northern Ireland, Derry City and Strabane District Council and the Art Fund. And you can see Tilt at Windmills at CCA until the 18th of December 2021. And you can find out more at ccadld.org as well as links to the Cryptark and Northern Ireland screen. And you can listen to our other roundtable podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or all good podcast providers. Thank you all for listening.